Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for, for putting together a really interesting workshop and thank you all very much for your patience in uh, the disrupted schedule. Um, as I'll explain in a moment, I was supposed to uh, speak on Wednesday, but unfortunately there was tornadoes in my town. Um, so everyone in the town was spending the evening in their basements, um, sheltering from tornadoes. So, uh, so I'll be talking today about P1 fibrations and heterotic F3 duality. Um, this is work done in collaboration with James Gray at Virginia Tech, Mozen Karkirin, who is currently at um, IBS in Dijon, uh, Paul Ullman, and Nikhil Raghuram. And here is the aforementioned uh, tornadoes as of Wednesday. So much better weather tonight. And thank you again for, for your patience on the schedule. So the motivation for tonight's talk, um, this is uh, up front, I should apologize and say a fairly geometrically focused talk um, with quite a bit of um, an emphasis on, on geometric features and string compactifications. And it can feel in this discussion a little bit um, of a question as physicists, why are, are some string theorists such as myself diving so deep into um, questions in algebraic geometry? And the motivation for that very broadly is I think part of a program that has been extremely fruitful in the last number of years, which is broadly a better understanding of possible string effective field theories in various dimensions. So this has um, led to lots of interesting work in the Swampland program, some of which we've heard about this week. And um, more generally, it is the question of within string theory, um, we do not have the liberty in most um, dimensions to engineer any effective field theory we like. We're constrained from higher dimensional origins of those theories. So the question um, of what possible effective field theories you can realize in string theory in a given dimension are intrinsically linked to the questions of how does one compactify extra dimensions, i.e. provide string geometric backgrounds for that theory, and then how does that constrain what physics you're allowed to write down? So the underlying motivation for my talk is this, this Venn diagram of, for example, here in 40, um, what is the space of all possible effective theories? Where do string compactifications lie? And then this amorphous um, purple oval, the string pheno ones, what class of field theories are we interested in um, in a given dimension? And can we characterize the properties or constraints, um, or perhaps even eliminate the possibility that such theories arise from string theory? So um, in today's talk, I'm going to be combining information from two different types of string dimensional reductions. Um, this would be heterotic string theory in 10 dimensions and F theory, which is the um, strongly coupled limit of type 2b, um, formulated in some sense as a 12 dimensional theory. So the goal is going to be to systematically construct and study a large new class of string vacua and to use string dualities to try and um, to do this study and to classify how the topology and geometric um, constraints in these theories talk to the effective theory in detail. So in particular, the structure of elliptic and K3 vibrations in Calabi-A manifolds is gonna be the focus of my talk today. So why would anyone, and particularly again, physicists be interested in this particular um, subset of geometry? Uh, the short answer for this is that uh, vibration structures inside string compactification manifolds play a very key role in string dualities. Um, the existence of, for example, um, in, in F theory and M theory, elliptic fibers, um, S1 dimensional reductions, elliptic and K3 vibrations and heterotic F theory duality, heterotic type 2A duality. Um, so there are many examples where this substructure of a calabi manifold plays a very significant role. In addition, calabi manifolds are extremely um, difficult beasts to write much down about explicitly, at least in terms of their metrics. Um, they, except for very special cases, calabi metrics are not known analytically, um, only numerically. And so the fiber structure at least gives you some information about how to sort of decompose a complicated manifold into pieces, um, potentially much simpler pieces. Um, this can uh, simplify uh, the structure and increase calculability of intersection numbers, forms of metrics, and various ingredients of your effective field theory. And then perhaps most importantly, um, the existence of vibration structures within Calabiaus uh, plays a very pivotal role in addressing the question of whether there are actually a finite number of such backgrounds for string compactifications. So it is unknown for Calabiao n folds where n is three or greater, whether there is in fact a finite number of such manifolds. 
And the, that question, of course, is very much um, a question for the string landscape. So whether you expect an infinite or finite number of different effective field theories from string theory for n equals one in 4D, for example. So um, the reason that this uh, the vibration structures play such an important role is that it is actually understood that elliptically fibered manifolds are finite. So um, within the set of all possible Calabiaus, elliptic vibrations play a special role. These theorems um, to this effect date back from the early 90s to work of Mark Gross and Antonella Grassi, who proved that if a Calabiao manifold is a so-called genus one fibered manifold, which I'll discuss more in just a second, then the number of such things is finite. And recently, um, building on uh, the, the strength of the minimal model program, uh, a set of mathematicians, Ducerbo and Spaldi, and then later Kausher Berker, um, have proved that there is a finite number of elliptically fibered Calabiao four and five folds as well. So if you impose this additional structure on a Calabia manifold, namely that it's fibered, then you uh, get a handle on finiteness for that class. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, because again, this is a lot of geometric discussion um, very early in the day, uh, let's do a quick reminder of what we mean by this. So a vibration is a surjective morphism from the manifold in question, in my case, a Calabia to another manifold, um, B, which I'll refer to as the base, such that for almost all points in the base, B and B prime, the inverse image of this projection is homotopic, i.e. the fibers look pretty much the same. So I'm, I'm for, uh, foreshadowing some terminology here. What this means is that I can decompose the manifold into two pieces, just like Lego toys, I can pull them apart. Um, the top part is the so-called fiber. This is your inverse image of points in the base, and the base is the image of that surjection, uh, the target of a surjection. If a continuous map exists from the base back up to the total manifold, um, which satisfies this property, namely that the projection of the mapping is the point again, um, for all points, this is called a section to the vibration. And um, terminology in the case of elliptic vibrations is that if a section exists, um, we refer to in general, what would be a torus or genus one fibered manifold as elliptic, since that vibration structure provides an addition law on the elliptic fibers. So just in quick summary, I take a mystery manifold and the existence of a vibration structure allows me to decompose it into a fiber and a base. That fiber in a base is not in general a product, although my bad diagram sort of implies that. And I've um, popped a picture of a Mobius strip in here to remind us all what a non-trivial vibration looks like. So the Mobius strip is of course, um, locally the product of an interval in a circle. Over each point in a circle, there's an interval that lives above it. But um, in the case of the Mobius strip, that has a non-trivial twist as we move around the circle. Likewise, in the case of the Club Yao, these fibers will be non-trivially twisted over as we move over this manifold, but since this will be a six uh, complex dimensional manifold, this is harder to visualize than the Mobius strip. Okay, so that's what I mean by vibration. So for quite some time, um, I think it was the, the statement in the string compactification literature that although we knew that some subsets of Club Yao's must be finite, namely those that were fibered, um, there was a feeling that those were special, um, that they were probably not generic within the set of possible Calabiaos, that regions where string dualities would give you the same effective theories, again, were sort of special branches um, of a given string vacuum space and not the generic um, points. Recently, quite a bit of light has shown that that's not actually the case. So it has turned out that for almost all Calabia manifolds that we know how to build in various dimensions, essentially all of them exhibit vibration structures of the type I was just describing. In particular, 99% of known Calabia three and four folds admit genus one vibrations. Um, studies of this have been done by myself and my collaborators, as well as Wadi Taylor at MIST and, um, and his student, uh, Yu Chen Huang. Um, the observations that, uh, that we and various others have made is that if you were to pick a generic Calabia manifold, so this is again a manifold, um, of a simple type to satisfy the equations of motion of string theory. In general, they did not have to admit vibrations, but they do. And we see that by observation. And indeed, they don't admit just one, they can actually be described in multiple different ways in this fiber-based decomposition that I just described. Surprisingly, the existence um, of these fibers being ubiquitous um, in known data sets means that these are no longer just special classes of uh, geometries for which you will have dual types of, of string compactifications, for example, heterotic F-theory or M-theory F-theory, um, heterotic type 2A. 
Indeed, the, the statement is that because fibration structures appear so commonly in Calabia data sets, this is in some sense the generic feature. So here, this is the famous Kreutzer-Skarka plot of the Hodge numbers of Calabia threefolds. Each of these data points represents a distinct topology for a Calabia threefold. And overlaid on this, um, this plot is actually, as you can see from, um, from 2012, quite some time ago, this is much uh, denser now, but these are the topologies that are known to correspond to elliptically fibered manifolds. So again, 99% of them will have a vibration. So this has been um, of interest for some time. What I want to dive into in today's talk is actually um, a little bit of uh, a closer look at these geometries and indeed to investigate the base manifolds as they can appear for elliptic vibrations. So um, the classification of elliptic threefolds due to Gross and Grassi gave a very well-defined set of possible two-dimensional complex base surfaces for an elliptic threefold. So remember the fiber in the base, the, the fiber is a Calabia one-fold or a genus one, um, T2 is a real manifold. Um, so this is a one complex dimensional fiber over a two complex dimensional base to form a threefold. And the work of Gross and Grassi showed that the possible bases that could arise were from a very limited set um, initially. Uh, these were the Enrique surface, the Del Pezzos, Hertzbrook surfaces, and blowups of Hertzbrook surfaces. Now, there are many of these. There's at least 40,000 um, bases that are known um, to be realized as toric surfaces, and many more that could be non toric. But the key point here is that they all are birational, namely, they can be achieved by simple geometric surgery from a very simple list here. And in particular, the base um, that the sort of the generic structure um, that's appearing in these base surfaces is really characterized by blowups of Hertzbrook surfaces. Hertzbrook surfaces are what are referred to as rational surfaces. And in particular, they are fibered as well, but unlike in the Calabiao case where they are fibered with another Calabiao, a T2 fibered over a base, Hertzbrook surfaces are fibered by uh, complex projective one spaces, i.e. topological S2s. The statement here is that if you pick something out of a hat that's a general blow up of some Hertzbrook surface, the generic um, 2D base of a Calabiao threefold will be uh, exhibit a P1 vibration structure. This was an interesting fact about Calabia threefolds and recently due to work that appeared last year from Berger, uh, De Cherbo and Svaldi, um, their approach to classifying and, and characterizing the finiteness of Calabia fourfolds and fivefolds has shown using birational geometry in the minimal model program that indeed they can characterize bases of Calabiaos also as being fibered. So I realize this is many many fibers, we have an elliptic fiber stacked over a base, and now I'm talking about substructure in that base, which is that topological S2s, P1s, as a complex manifold, um, can be exhibited in most of these bases. Um, in particular, they characterize something that they call towers of Fano vibrations that involve rational or P1 vibrations. So the idea that I want to play with in today's talk is that PUA1 vibrations are going to play a central role in characterizing elliptic vibrations, and if you can say what happens to the base manifolds of Calabia geometries, you can say what happens to the whole geometry in great detail, and then hopefully the effective physics at the end of the day. So that was a lot of moving parts. I apologize for too many vibrations for one slide, um, but hopefully the rough motivation is clear. So um, just to say a few more comments about P1 vibrations. So again, a definition, um, I'm interested in bases of Calabia manifolds, and I'll refer to that as calligraphic B here. This will be referred to as P1 fibered if the inverse image of each point in some subbase, um, this is straight BN minus one, is a topological P1, i.e. S2, over generic points. And to begin with, it is uh, very easy to note that um, P1 vibrations can be divided into two very simple classes. The first are those that are nowhere degenerate, i.e. they are P1 vibrations that are in fact P1 bundles. So literally every point over a base, which look like little flowers or lollipops in this diagram, um, every point is a simple P1. So a topological S2 over every point in some base. And then of course you can have a vibration that is not a pure bundle, um, for generic points, it can exhibit a smooth P1 fiber, and at special points, it could degenerate um, in higher co-dimension to some uh, singular or reducible um, fibers. It turns out that for P1 vibrations, the way that they can degenerate is very constrained, and effectively, the only thing that can happen is that one P1 can split into two. So um, I'm going to broadly 
try and characterize the, the um, geometry of these bases into two. Either I'll have a P1 vibration that is um, everywhere uniform or one that breaks into multiple pieces at higher co-dimension, a degenerate vibration. So um, here I'm going to consider uh, only simply connected base manifolds from IP1 vibrations with trivial so-called Brouwer group. And um, in these two cases, those that degenerate or not, there's quite a lot known about the structure of what P1 vibrations can look like over manifolds. So um, for the non-degenerate case, all non-degenerate P1 vibrations, i.e. all P1 bundles, um, in the case of trivial Brouwer group can be written as the projectivization of some rank two bundle. Um, this means that if you were to take um, the total space of a vector bundle and then to projectivize the fibers, just like you do for CPN, so wrapping points um, as they go to infinity back to themselves, uh, then if you were to projectivize that object, you will form for the rank two, this is turning into a one complex dimensional fiber and you will form a P1 vibration. Examples of these first appeared in the string literature and the work of Friedman, Morgan, and Witten, and they chose very simple rank two bundles indeed to projectivize. They chose a sum of a trivial bundle and a line bundle, here written OD, over some base manifold BN minus one. The projectivization of this was the type of P1 base that they characterized, first used in heterotic F theory duality, as we'll return to in a moment. In case two, where I can have a degenerate um, vibration, there's actually a robust mathematics literature that studies P1 bundles that do degenerate. And this is called the Sarkozov program, which studies so-called conic bundles. The terminology arises from the birational geometry that can map these degenerations back to a description of the fiber as a degree two polynomial in CP2. This is generically a P1. However, over higher co-dimensional loci in the base manifold, this defining equation, which is a quartic, a quadratic, excuse me, um, can factor into a product of two linear functions in P2, leading to a degeneration of the P1 fiber into two distinct P1s over some discriminant locus. So, so far I've not said anything super deep. I can projectivize a bundle in order to produce an everywhere non-degenerate P1 vibration, or the Sarkozov program using a so-called conic bundle can produce something that can degenerate at higher co-dimension. So the goals um, of the work that uh, my collaborators and I are undertaking and um, the, the overview that I want to give you of today's talk is to try and specify as much as um, information as possible about each type of vibration. Um, can we specify its topology, the Calabial vibrations that can exist over these bases, and then to ask questions about where we can find interesting physics. Now that is of course an extremely broad question um, since these types of geometries could appear in many different corners of string theory. Um, so to narrow this down a bit, um, one possible area that is very natural to study is more general forms of the duality between the heterotic uh, E8 cross E8 or SO32 strings and F0. Um, this also, the goal is to lay the groundwork for more general systematic data sets of backgrounds for string compactifications. So um, as I mentioned, the Kreutzer Scarca database, which is um, a collection of about uh, half a billion toric polytopes, has been extremely important in terms of providing a playground for string theorists to explore string effective field theories in various dimensions. Um, the current largest collection of elliptic Calabial fourfolds um, has been built as Weierstrass models over P1 fibered um, P1 bundle, in fact, bases um, of Friedman Morgan Witten type. Um, this work was started by myself and Wadi Taylor and then extended by Taylor and Halverson. So large data sets of Calabials have been built using this technique. But what we have recently found is that there are much more general um, structures possible in the context of P1 vibrations, i.e. projectivizations of, for example, more general bundles than simply um, an abelian sum. And this can lead to different physics and different consequences for dualities. Um, it's going to be helpful to divide this discussion into um, 60 versus 40 effective physics, i.e. elliptic Calabia threefolds and fourfolds, respectively and P-bun fibered bases, which are surfaces in the case of Calabial threefolds in six dimensional effective physics, um, or uh, complex threefolds in the case of Calabial fourfolds. It's also going to be useful to briefly review heterotic F-theory duality as that will be the sort of star physics for the remainder of the talk. So um, what is in one slide or less um, a reminder of the E across the eight heterotic string? Um, for the purposes of today's talk, I'm interested in the geometric ingredients of this theory. So we begin with a 10D E8 cross E8 heterotic string, and we want to reduce this theory down to an N equals one four dimensional solution. 
Um, to do this, we're going to look for a product solution of R13 cross a compact complex manifold, which I will take to be a Calabi L3 fold referred to as X3. In addition, the fact that we have E8 cross E8 gauge fields in 10 dimensions means that we have to specify gauge field VEVs um, for the hidden dimensions, i.e. over the Calabi L manifold. And mathematically, this is realized as two principal bundles over the Calabi L, V1 and V2, um, with structure groups H, which can be embedded into each E8 factor. This leads to a collection of holomorphic Mumford polystable vector bundles in various representations. And compactifying that full theory on X hopefully leads to an n equals one supersymmetric theory in 4D. While the presence of the vector bundle will break E8 um, into a product, uh, well, excuse me, into a subgroup, um, viewing this as a, a product of um, a maximal subgroup H times G. If you have a bundle with structure group H, the commutant of that structure group within E8 will be the visible um, low energy gauge group upon dimensional reduction. So examples, if H is SUN, where N is three, four, or five, this will lead to gut theories in four dimensions with E6, SO10, or SU5 gauge symmetry realized. There's an anomaly cancellation condition from the Green-Schwartz mechanism, um, Green-Schwartz anomaly cancellation in 10D, which tells you that um, the Chern classes of the holomorphic tangent bundle and those of your vector bundles over the Calabi-Yau must balance up to effective classes that could be wrapped by NS5 planes. Um, indeed, the full matter content of the theory is characterized in terms of the geometric background of the calabi -Yau. Matter that will be charged under the gauge group um, is given by bundle-valued cohomology. Um, the singlets, of course, are the famous Kähler and complex structure moduli of a calabi -Yau threefold, and also bundle moduli, um, traceless endomorphism-valued one forms in the bundle. So the takeaway message is to specify a heterotic background, I need to tell you about a calabi -Yau threefold and two holomorphic vector bundles over it, and the rest of the theory will be fully specified by that choice. Adding to the complexity of the story, I need made now to also comment on F-theory, which is an interesting beast. F-theory is um, the, basically a, a geometric realization of information involving the axiodilaton of the type 2b string. Um, treating the information of the axiodiliton um, and its symmetries and SL2Z invariants as a physical um, symmetry that can be fibered over the compactification manifold of type 2b. We can view an elliptically fibered, um, in this case I'm referring to a Calabi L fourfold, thinking about um, n equals one in 4D, uh, a fourfold uh, Y4, which is elliptically fibered over some base. And the information and degeneration of that elliptic vibration encodes information about degeneration in, um, or rather singularities from the point of view of the axiodiliton, um, which are encoding the information and position of seven brains within the type 2b theory. If the vibration has a section, um, then geometrically this vibration can be written in so-called Weierstrass form, which is a simple algebraic description of an elliptic fiber, which can be realized over every point in some base manifold. Um, the degenerations of that elliptic fiber, as I mentioned, encode positions of seven brains. That's given by the discriminant locus, um, a simple explicit polynomial in the base. And then divisors inside that base will carry um, gut symmetries. Curves at higher co-dimension um, can refer to as intersections of seven brains that will be by fundamental matter. And at higher co-dimension still, we can talk about Yukawa interactions and structure of the superpotential in the N equals one theory. Um, I won't get into details of this, but of course, also um, there's the possibility of G-flux, thinking of uh, F-theory, M-theory dualities, and this can be described in the resolved um, M-theory limit. Okay, so for the purposes of today's talk, what is it that I want to, to emphasize about heterotic F-theory duality? Heterotic F-theory duality will exist if there is certain substructure to the calabi backgrounds of these two theories. Specifically, um, the work of Morris and Vafa and then many others highlighted an adiabatic um, matching of 8D effective physics that can be reduced to lower dimensions. The observation in eight dimensions is that the heterotic theory on a T2 provides the exact same effective physics as F theory on a K3. If that um, eight dimensional duality is fibered point by point over some shared manifold, which I've referred to here as B2, I can reduce this correspondence to a duality in lower dimensions. Phrased differently, if um, I have two manifolds on either side of my compactification, an, a man at Calabi X and a Calabi Y for heterotic and F theory respectively, then if 
the heterotic geometry is elliptically fibered, and if the F-theory geometry admits not just an elliptic fibration, but also a P1 fibration in the base, this will can be combined to describe the F-theory geometry as a K3 fibration, then these two theories will produce the same effective physics. Now, in the context of everything else I've said so far, if you throw a dart at one of the, the Calabiaus that we know how to construct a string background so far, we find that they are essentially all elliptically fibered. This means that at least on, say, the heterotic side, a generic heterotic vacuum is expected to have an F-theory dual. Likewise, the ubiquity of the P1 fibrations inside bases of fourfolds show that essentially all Calabiao fourfolds that we know how to build um, are also going to exhibit K3 fibrations, or phrased a bit differently, we know due to the work of De Cherbos, Valdi, and Burker that um, K3 fibrations follow very naturally with elliptic fibrations in the context of elliptically fibered Calabiao fourfolds. Okay, so where these two theories are dual, we know there's a finite um, set of geometries to study due to finiteness results I mentioned earlier, and we know that generically most heterotic vacua appear to have an F-theory dual, and most F-theory vacua will have a heterotic dual. So the question is, can we use structure of, can we use information about this substructure of geometry to say something about effective physics or how we interpret this duality, what information we can obtain through one description or the other. Um, so again, just a really quick duality summary. Heterotic side will be interested in specifying information of two vector bundles and a manifold. Um, the vector bundles will be slope zero, polystable, holomorphic bundles, which satisfy an anomaly cancellation condition over an elliptically fibered Calabiao n fold. And within F theory, we will specify elliptically and K3 fibered four or three folds if we're in six dimensions, um, which uh, exhibit substructures such that the base is P1 fibered. Um, the moduli spaces and geometric properties of these two theories should agree. Okay. Um, as I said before, P1 fibrations appear to be ubiquitous. This means that generic geometries will lead to heterotic F theory dual pairs. Um, just to be clear, I said this previously, but um, in general, if you have a K3 fibration, that's what you need to have a heterotic dual. But if that also exists with an elliptic fibration, which of course is necessary in F theory, the sort of commutativity of this diagram tells you that your base must be P1 fibered. As I mentioned previously, the sort of standard in the literature for the standard classes of heterotic F theory duality that have been studied to date were base P1 fibrations that were constructed as the projectivization of two line bundles. Um, important observation that will be important later is that projectivization of this type is defined only up to a twist by a line bundle. And so without loss of generality, we can write friedman morgan witten form for this base as the projectivization of a trivial bundle plus a single line bundle, which I'm referring to as OD, since I can always twist an arbitrary sum of line bundles L1 plus L2 with L1 dual in order to put it into this form. Okay, so here's the friedman morgan witten um, geometric correspondence uh, in a one slide summary. In general, if you choose topology of bundles on the heterotic side, this chooses a twist for you of the P1 vibration. So just like the Mobius strip is a non-trivial twist of an interval over a circle, the P1 needs to be fibered non-trivially over its base manifold. Um, we can expand on the heterotic side, the second turn class of the vector bundles, which enter into anomaly cancellation conditions in terms of a simple basis of forms. And anomaly cancellation tells you that you can characterize uh, a piece of this the second turn class in terms of the topology of the shared base manifold between heterotic F-theory duality and the twist, let's call it T. On the F-theory side, Friedman, Morgan, Witten characterized um, the P1 fibered bases in terms of this projectivization of a trivial bundle and a line bundle. You can easily work out what the topology of that projectivization should be. And it indeed is also specified by a twist T, which turns out to be the same one across heterotic F3 dual pairs. Um, the details of this calculation are not important for today if one hasn't seen it before, um, but the basic statement is that we are specifying a twist to a P1 vibration in F theory. This gives you a second churn class in heterotic and vice versa. So in head F dual pairs, these two Ts um, were shown to be the same by Friedman, Morgan, Witten and using different effective field theory means by Grimm and Taylor. Grimm and Taylor. Okay, um, so let's look at, to begin with, P1 fibered bases of Calabiao threefolds. So this would be a simpler case of six dimensional compactifications um, of heterotic F theory dual pairs. 
And here the fibration is of a particular simply, simple form. Um, the base of an elliptic fibration is a two complex dimensional manifold, which will be P1 fibered over P1. Um, in the, the first case, non-degenerate fibrations of this form have to be projectivizations of a bundle, as I mentioned before, a rank two bundle. And um, happily over P1, every bundle splits as a sum of line bundles. So in fact, the generic P1 bundle in six dimensions or for a Clavia threefold is of the form commonly assumed in heterotic f theory duality, friedman morgan witten form. Um, and this uh, has a name, well, the name as a Hertzebrook surface in the characterization of complex surfaces. Perturbative heterotic F theory duality in 60, this matching of topology of the bundle and twist of the, the F theory base manifold um, tells you that the topology, the C2 of your two bundles must be 12 plus or minus N, where N here is the N of Hertzbrook. In six dimensions, you can also have degenerate vibrations. These correspond to conic bundles over a simple P1. And these have a very simple six dimensional interpretation in terms of the effective theory. These are simply extra tensor multiplets in the 60 theory. Um, in the heterotic side, these correspond to heterotic theories with NS fibrins. Um, it might seem that standard heterotic F theory duality in this case encompasses sort of everything that is possible, and um, there's not much of interest that could happen in the 60 physics. But um, in our work, we found that even here, the structure of P1 fibrations has a bit more flexibility to it than had been realized in the literature in the past. So, um, in general, a standard form of a conic bundle um, beginning on the degeneration side is characterized by a discriminant locus where you get extra P1s in the fiber, um, a generic twist to the P1 fibration, which plays the role of OD in the projectivization of a simple line bundle, and a two-sheeted cover of the vase, which is the multi-section of your conic. Um, in general, as we'll see in a second, the locus of these degenerations where you have multiple P1s um, from the interpretation that these are producing extra tensor multiplets in 60, you would expect these to correspond to NS5 brains, as I mentioned previously, and indeed they do. So let me give one interesting effect involving conic bundles and then one interesting effect involving um, ordinary P1 bundles in six dimensions to begin. Uh, it turns out that one base surface can admit more than one P1 vibration generically. Um, examples of this were understood in the very first papers written about heterotic F theory duality by Morrison and Boffa. An example of this is the Hertzbrook, Hertzbrook surface F0, which can be written as P1 times P1. And here, there's nothing to say which one of these P1s is the fiber and which one of these is the base. So there's a trivial symmetry which can be realized by interchanging the two. Um, this symmetry might seem so, so sort of basic and simple, it's just simply labeling of what you're referring to as a fiber and a base that there should be no physics. Uh, associated to it. But in fact, across the heterotic duality, there is very uh, non-trivial physics indeed. It turns out that the interchanging of the fiber-based roles of these P1s corresponds across the heterotic duality to an inversion of the heterotic uh, coupling, i.e. the dilaton is, referred, is defined as a, a ratio of the volumes of these P1 fiber and base. And in a limit that you're flipping the two, you're actually inverting the dilaton. This was studied by Duff, Manazian, and Witten, who showed that um, this simple uh, discrete automorphism in the F theory geometry could be realized as a very non-trivial strong weak coupling heterotic heterotic duality in six dimensions. Several years ago, my collaborators and I um, showed that this can be generalized to P1 vibrations that can be degenerate, um, namely to conic bundles. So this is a realization, for example, of Del Pezzo II as a P1 vibration, where there is again an interchange two P1s that can be interchanged in the space. And here, um, the interchange symmetry is again a strong weak um, duality mixing in the heterotic theory. Um, instead, though, of a simple inversion of the dilaton, strong weak coupling, one is actually mixing what one meant by the dilaton and five brain moduli into one another. So here, if T1, T2, and T3 are Kähler moduli associated to these ambient PN factors, the dilaton is defined as this ratio, and fiber interchange switches these. So again, it'll be a strong weak coupling duality, but much more complicated. Um, heterotic heterotic uh, correspondences involving reshuffling tensor multiplets and the coupling of the theory are possible. Okay, so that was one um, flavor of something non trivial that can happen even in 60 physics. Another that is even more novel is um, the so called jumping phenomena. So, although every bundle over P1 can be written as a sum of line bundles, subtle things are possible. For example, um, one can write down this rank two vector bundle which is defined as a non-trivial extension of the trivial bundle in O2 over P1. 
since um, the extension class of this, so extension refers here to a mixing, the extent to which V2 is not simply a direct sum of these two pieces, but is they're non-trivially glued together as we move over the base manifold. The fact that this extension is non-trivial, um, this bundle admits a one-dimensional family of non-trivial extensions. And it's easy to show that for generic non-zero values of this extension, the bundle is simply a direct sum of line bundles as it must be over P1. But what happens when the extension class goes to zero? Then it turns out that the bundle actually jumps to a different holomorphic realization. It becomes O plus O2. These are two holomorphically distinct, topologically distinct bundles over CP1. So a single parametric description of a bundle, this extension bundle, can jump between two distinct holomorphic bundles at special loci in its parameter space. We might say, who cares? The reason we care is that when we projectivize this extension bundle to make a complex base surface for a Calabi-L threefold, we find that this jumping can actually be inherited by the whole elliptic fibration structure. So if we define a complex base surface to be the projectivization of this extension bundle, we find that when that extension class is non-zero, the base surface is F0, and when the extension class is tuned to be zero, this base surface jumps to F2. In terms of complex geometry, this happens because as we tune the complex structure of the elliptic threefold over the space, a new um, minus two curve actually becomes effective and the fibration structure jumps between F0 and F2 in the base. Um, this, it is easy to show that this jumping can actually occur between any even pair of Hertzebrook surfaces, Fn where n is even, and any odd pair. So F2m and F2n where n and m are different and the same for the odd uh, cohort. Now, again, I'm, I'm giving lots of, of structure here, so let's try and unpack why this is of some interest. The reason that this is interesting is that much work has been done to date in um, characterizing vacua of F-theory in four dimensions and in six dimensions by fixing, for example, toric base surfaces and characterizing the full effective physics of that that can be realized. F-theory has been one of the main playgrounds for swampland type programs precisely by choosing a surface and characterizing everything that can happen. The thing that's novel here is that we have two distinct complex surfaces, different um, topologically distinct objects, um, and one Calabiao can actually jump between two surfaces in its description. So a simple realization of this for the case of F0, F2 is um, of the form that I've given here. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through the details of this jumping, but it's easy to work out algebraically. Jumping of the effective cone is what is realized inside the Calabiao threefold. So let me try and again, take a step back and say, what does this somewhat esoteric geometric fact tell you that's quite surprising about F-theory vacua in six dimensions? We have one elliptic manifold that can jump over two distinct bases. This has been partially observed before for F0 and F2 in that the jumping that occurs here actually happens at smooth points in the complex structure of the elliptic threefold. So this is actually a smooth um, deformation from the point of view of the Calabia. Um, this was first observed by Morrison and Vafa, but we found that there is actually other possibilities, even in six dimensions, that can happen over um, singular, but not two singular points in the moduli space. For example, elliptic vibrations over F1 can jump to contain a minus three curve at higher co-dimension, which leads to a singular elliptic vibration over the Hertzebrook surface F3. In particular, what we find is that um, over the minus three curve, an SO8 singularity um, appears with a so-called superconformal point, i.e. in Weierstrass language, a 4, 6, 12 point at the intersection of an SO8 divisor and an I1 uh, locus in the discriminant. The reason that this is surprising is that um, the existence of symmetries over this minus three curve in Hertzbrook um, are a classic example of a so-called non higgsable cluster within F-theory. This is something where the simple toric form of the base geometry, we would have said characterized all the effective physics that we were interested in generically. However, the deformation that we're seeing that can move us between these two different base manifolds is realized as a non-toric deformation. From the point of view of this SCFT theory, um, which corresponds to the SO8 singularity with the, the superconformal locus, this actually has two Higgs branches and a Coulomb branch. It's possible to Higgs to the F1 base, which breaks gauge symmetry completely. We can Higgs to a generic SU3, which would be the non higgsable cluster over um, the minus three curve. And you could also blow up the minus, uh, the four, six, 12 point or the, the um, SCFT point 
um, by moving along a tensor branch and transition back to F4, a topologically distinct um, Hertzberg base, this would be the Coulomb branch of the theory. The reason that this is somewhat novel is that historically um, within 60 F theory vacua, um, to the best of my knowledge, only two of these were ever visible before, namely um, the bottom two. So uh, theories that have SEFT loci and have two Higgs branches and a Coulomb branch are not previously seen. This is similar in spirit to um, so-called SEFT matter transitions, um, where superconformal loci in six dimensions can lead to um, a weird uh, effects um, from the point of view of ordinary field theory, where you have a single gauge group, which can, um, by moving through SCFT loci, change the matter representations of the theory. Um, this has been studied by various people, including me and my collaborators in the past. Um, this is strange from the heterotic point of view, however, though. Transitioning between these two different bases seems to be moving you between two wildly different topological heterotic theories. Remember, the, the twist of the base manifold is anchoring you to particular Chern classes of heterotic bundles, and these are very different um, that you're transitioning between across the pair. However, we have to be careful because this transition that we're doing in complex structure moduli um, does not appear to be compatible with both stable degeneration limits in the normal F1 and F3 geometries. Um, so this may be something that's intrinsically a strongly coupled effect from the point of view of the heterotic theory and may not be visible or simply understandable in any weakly coupled heterotic language. It's important to note that um, as the complex structure is varied, as we deform the elliptic vibration over F3 back into F1, the minus three curve does not simply disappear. Um, it becomes reducible into minus one and degree zero curves. Why is this um, crucial? Because this is an example from the point of view of BPS objects in the theory, an example of something like wall crossing phenomena in the 6D theory. And as I mentioned previously, this is a important role to play in the structure of what's possible in 6D effective physics, in that historically, we would have talked about so-called non-hexable clusters. These were generic gauge groups where you had no matter um, present in the theory to, to gauge them. They are non-hexable and sort of ubiquitous as um, characterizing sort of basic building blocks of F-theory in six dimensions. What this um, example is showing though, is that if you tune such non higgsable clusters to um, more special points in their moduli space, they become higgsable. And that is somewhat novel. So this raises questions about exactly how to characterize vacua in the six dimensions. I am somewhat low on time. So let me try and just highlight um, a couple of other effects from these novel geometries and what they correspond to for heterotic F-theory duality. Moving forward into F-theory in four dimensions, um, I want to begin by considering so-called P1 bundles. Again, these are the non-degenerate vibrations, the easiest type. I mentioned that everything in six dimensions that was a P1 bundle could be of friedman morgan witten form, namely a projectivization of a sum of line bundles. However, in general, once we're in four-dimensional compactifications, that is P1 bundles, um, complex threefolds that could be described as P1 bundles, namely as the projectivization of a bundle over a 2D base. Um, the question then becomes, what 2D bundles can I projectivize over an arbitrary complex surface? I.e., what is the generic rank two bundle over a surface? Note that the friedman morgan witten form of two line bundles is of course not the op only option anymore. The answer to this was provided some time ago by Ser, um, and he gave a general construction for rank two vector bundles over an arbitrary complex surface. He showed that any such vector bundle can be described as a non-trivial extension of the trivial bundle, a line bundle tensored with an ideal sheaf I, where Z is a set of points. As in the friedman morgan witten case, um, the Hodge numbers of this base surface are easy to work out. Um, the first turn class of this projectivized base is the same as friedman morgan witten case, which means that you would have the same Weierstrass coefficients for your Calabi L fourfold, but um, its second turn class has new contributions due to this ideal chief. So we can ask, what does this more general type of P1 bundle do for us? What is possible beyond what friedman morgan witten wrote down when they initially specified heterotic F-theory duality? So we want to explicitly um, build such an object. And from the point of view of characterizing heterotic duals, um, this projectivization will naturally come equipped with a canonical section to the vibration. Um, in general, however, it is rational. What that means is that the section isn't um, diffeomorphic to the two-dimensional two base of this complex threefold. Instead, it's only birational to it. So the section can actually wrap certain P1s over higher uh, co-dimensional loci in the base. 
If this ideal sheaf is absent, so if we're just um, having a non-trivial extension of two bundles, then um, you can show that this extension will have two holomorphic sections, um, i.e. if it will have two holomorphic sections, if and only if the uh, extension splits. So this is sort of standard heterotic F-theory duality with standard friedman morgan witten form. If, however, um, we have a non-trivial extension, there will be only a single section to this P1 vibration. And if the ideal sheaf is present, you can have one or two rational sections. Um, just a word on sections versus not. Um, a bit of terminology. In general, in order to have heterotic F theory duality really play a key role, you really expect the P1 fibration to have a section. And the reason for this is that you want to fiber this adiabatically over every point in some shared manifold. Um, you need a mapping to pick out one point in the fiber over each point in the base. That's the case of a section. In examples where we do not have a section, there will be what are called multi-sections, which are N-sheeted covers of the base. But in these cases, the base is not a metric submanifold. There's no effective divisor, which is even birational to the base. And so uh, the question of whether you expect heterotic f theory duality to hold is a bit more amorphous. Okay, so one other um, comment that we can take. Um, we can consider the form of anomaly cancellation or the D3 pad pole condition in the N equals one theory. Um, this has a famous formula derived from M theory, um, the index of the Calabi-L fourfold, one uh, over 24 times the Euler number, can be related to an integral of the G of flux plus the number of D3s. In the absence of flux, it simply counts the number of D3s. If we take um, a bundle that is a friedman morgan witten form, the projectivization of the trivial bundle and a line bundle, then um, this anomaly cancellation condition takes a very specific form in terms of the geometry of the shared 2D base manifold across the heterotic F-theory dual pair. The right-hand side is essentially the minimal number of D3s in the absence of flux. friedman morgan witten showed that this dual heterotic um, calculation matching the topology of the heterotic bundles in the way that I mentioned, tells you that the number of fiber wrapping NS fibrains in the heterotic theory is given by exactly the same integral independently on the heterotic side. So you can show that what you mean by anomaly cancellation in the heterotic theory and in the F theory are specified entirely by this twist data, um, which is specifying topology on both sides and the second term class of the, the complex base that is shared across the dual pair. So um, what we're saying is that across heterotic F-theory duality, um, anomaly cancellation makes good sense in normal friedman morgan witten form. Question, what happens to this matching when um, the base that you're projectivizing is no longer friedman morgan witten form? If we have one of these more general bundles, we can ask what happens to anomaly cancellation. What we find is that in the case that we're projectivizing something with this extra ideal sheaf component, we seem to offset the standard anomaly matching by a weird factor of 120 times the number of points. So it seems that the number of D3s have decreased by 120. Um, this seems very weird. Um, and indeed, it is also puzzling from the point of view of heterotic F-theory duality in that naively the heterotic calculation would remain unchanged. And so it would seem that you have a mismatch across the two. However, a more careful derivation of these results shows that you actually need to be careful in reducing the topology of the fourfold into an integral over, um, in this case, the base of a K3 vibration, B2. In the case that you have a non-trivial um, projectivization of an extension of this type, um, the section of P1 is actually a rational section, and as a result, is only birational to the base, not diffeomorphic to it. So taking into account that the zero locus of the section is the actual metric subvariety of this three-dimensional base, we can rephrase the ingredients of this integral as quantities over B2 tilde instead of B2. Um, the zero locus of the section rather than the base. So if we suppose, for example, that their ideal sheaf is supported at a single point and B2 uh, are characterized by the, as the ideal sheaf of a single point and B2 is uh, tilde is the blow up of B2 at one point, then um, using simple structure of the birational geometry, we can characterize, pull back the bundle and that we're projectivizing and characterize it. And if we use these facts, we can basically rearrange the Euler number calculation very succinctly into a simpler formula um, over the zero locus of the section, um, where now the topology of every object rearranges into the standard form. 
This is actually the usual heterotic duality formula, but it's for a heterotic geometry that is elliptically fibered over the zero locus of the rational section to the P1 bundle rather than the base of the K3 fibration. So what does this mean? It means that the interpretation of how we read off heterotic F3 dual pairs can shift in these cases. So this leads us to conjecture that in the case of a rational section to the P1 fibration, the heterotic dual appears to be defined over an elliptic threefold that's actually of the form X to B tilde, not the base of the K3 fibration itself. This can actually be verified um, in stable degeneration limits um, for the case of a rational section coming from a single point. Um, one algebraic description of this B3 can be simply written down as a hypersurface in P2, P2. Um, in the interests of time, I won't go into the details of this construction, but we can consider stable degeneration, breaking um, this manifold, the Clavio fourfold Y, into a fiber product of two DP9s glued together over a common base. And um, explicit calculation of the stable degeneration limit shows that indeed uh, the DP1 base, in this case, the blow up of one point, appears to be the base in the heterotic dual. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but simply to say that we can get the same result from multiple angles. So a comment on why one is interested in um, the explicit mapping of the duality of these so-called stable degeneration limits. In general, within the context of F-theory, which is um, a theory of mutually non-local seven brains, we're interested in weak coupling limits of all forms. We're interested in heterotic limits and send limits. And this was very nicely characterized um, by a description of these degenerations of the manifold as log semi-stable degenerations by Katz, Tanagi, and Weinhold. Any possible degeneration um, of this type will correspond to some weak coupling limit. It's beyond the scope of this talk to get into the technical details of what exactly a log semi-stable degeneration is, but it is breaking the Calabiao into two non-Calabiao halves that can be glued together over a sublocus. For K3 surfaces, um, in, so for Calabiao twofolds, there are only two such uh, degenerations that are possible. These correspond to the E8 cross E8 and the SO32 heterotic limits. So this tells you in eight dimensions that sort of the entire um, weak coupling limit, uh, every possible weak coupling limit of F-theory hits a heterotic theory. Now for Calabiao N folds with N greater than two, there appear to be more options. So an interesting question in this context is, Freeman Morgan Witten outlined one log semi stable degeneration in which they pull apart their manifold as a fiber product of two DP9s. If we increase the generality of these P1 fibrations, we seem to be seeing different structure uh, in the, the stable degeneration limits. And the question is can we explore more of those options? So, are there previously um, not understood weak coupling limits of F theory that may secretly be heterotic and more novel beasts entirely? So um, a few other effects that I don't have time to talk about. Um, Non-flat P1 fibrations lead to singularities in the heterotic manifold and bundle um, at higher co-dimensions, some of which were studied by Morris and Candelas et al. Um, P1 bundles with only one section. These are again, examples of log semi-stable degenerations potentially of very novel form. Um, conic bundles, which I haven't gotten into in four dimensions. These are the degenerating P1 fibrations um, with multi-sections only. Um, these, uh, in these cases, standard heterotic F theory duality appears to break down. So there's an open question, again, how many weak coupling limits in F theory can we realize with these geometries? Can we find SO32, CHL strings, or more general limits? Um, there are conjectures due to Heckman, Lin, and Yao that indeed maybe even the global existence of vibrations is not necessary for heterotic F theory. Maybe there's a more local formulation that is possible. Um, I have nothing deep to say about that, except to say that this more general base geometry that we're studying seems to show that there are many more weak coupling limits that are accessible than we had previous studied. So the standard Friedman Morgan Witten or the standard Sen limits seem to have many different cousins. So with that, I think I am out of time. So let me conclude by um, trying to take a step back and summarize the, the vast um, dump of geometric data that I gave you this evening. So what I tried to um, give you an overview of is um, novel features of a simple ingredient of a Calabiao geometry, namely its vibration structure and the structure of its base. These were a, a set of geometries that were not understood um, to be as common as, they, as we now realize in Calabiao geometry. And um, it appears that even in cases that were previously thought to be very well understood in six dimensions, novel phenomena are possible that can shed new light on possible connections between string effective theories 
and their characterization, the systematic characterization of them in 60 and 40. Um, I didn't have time to go into detail on this, but there's still questions, um, for example, in these jumping phenomena I mentioned about what the exact SCFT physics is of these transitions that we don't understand. Um, general P1 bundles um, can admit rational sections and the heterotic duals to find over them, I mentioned may be given um, by geometry of sections rather than the geometry of the vibration itself. Um, we develop tools uh, in general to sort of characterize um, conic bundle degenerations as well, which I didn't have time to get into in detail here, but this is providing a systematic toolkit to characterize arbitrary Calabria fourfold geometries in terms of their base substructure. The goal is to try and develop a framework to characterize um, these generic threefold bases for F theory Calabi L fourfolds as a goal towards systematically describing these geometry. And as a consequence of that, we hope to explore novel forms of heterotic F theory duality. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, now we'll, we are open to uh, questions or comments. Um, are you? Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. So, yeah, thank you very much for your very nice talk. Uh, I have a, a several questions, but maybe uh, maybe just one at this point. Uh, so, did you say something about this um, non hixable thing? Maybe I missed, but for example, uh, so. I mean, generally, we don't expect this Higgsing to happen at all in any part of the moduli space, right? For example, F3 to F1, which you are nicely showing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that can actually happen in the complex structure moduli space of the elliptic threefold. Right. Uh, so, so did you say something about this in terms of the 60 EFT? Maybe I missed. Great. So um, only very little. So uh, let me make sure I understand your question. So your question is, what exactly is the consequence of what I'm saying for non hexable clusters? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so this is something that we're interested in. I mean, in some sense, um, after we discovered this fact, we were rereading, you know, Morris and then um, Taylor and their characterization of, you know, mm -hmm. when they're first writing papers on non-hensible clusters. Right. We're not saying anything about the generic Weierstrass model over F3, um, where you have, you know, an SU3 totally perturbative um, 60 theory with no matter. There's, there's nothing field theoretically mysterious about that. Right. The claim is though, that you can tune that theory to a higher co-dimensional locus in its moduli space and a new branch opens up, which is not torically realized. That, if you read the fine print of what they're saying is not in contradiction to anything that, you know, Morris and Taylor wrote down when they were characterizing non hexable clusters, but it is surprising to, to me and to the rest of my collaborators, I think. Um, so we spent a long time worrying about like, is this, you know, actually a legitimate transition? Is there something weird going on here? And from the Calabiao point of view, there is there is nothing weird about it at all. It's a perfectly nice non-toric description of this manifold. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that is frustrating about it is that we don't have a good handle on the effective physics of that or what exactly this motion along the Higgs branch is because it involves these four, six, 12 points. So oh. it's, um, it's definitely an SCFT effect. And as I mentioned, like in these matter transitions um, that I studied with Wadi and Nikhil and James in the past as well. There's no simple field theory explanation of those either. So this is not the only effect like this that has come up in 60. This is something that needs an SCFT explanation. I personally am not an SCFT expert in 60, so I don't know quite how to phrase that yet, but, um, but it's not ordinary field theory and it's interesting. And it raises questions about how much more broad motion in these moduli spaces is possible. I see, because um, one thing we are realizing about this 4, 6, 12 deformation, which is very extreme boundary of the moduli space, is that this is um, most likely a decompactification. So maybe you go up and then down again in dimensions so that this can actually happen, which cannot be actually hmm. visible within the six dimensional setup. You're saying setup. from the point of view of the resolution, you would do that? No, actually, no, no. So actually, uh, it looks like whenever you reach beyond 4, 6, 12 in the complex structure moduli space, it looks like you're mm -hmm. actually decompactifying the, 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 the internal space partially at least. Hmm. So, it, I mean, because you, I mean, it's very hard to imagine such a Higgsing to happen at all in the, in the EFT uh, language because you don't have any meta to Higgs this. So It's but, certainly not, I mean, yeah, the, as I said, th these are something that um, is certainly not within ordinary. Field right. Field. But if you can go up and down in dimensions in a weird way, then maybe this can 
Uh, yeah, that's an interesting. I, as far as I know, mm -hmm. I don't see any indication that we're jumping dimensions, right. but that's an interesting mm -hmm. comment, and I would have to have to think about that further. So, yeah, I also am intrigued in this from sort of a wall crossing point of view in terms of mm -hmm. UPS yeah. objects along mm -hmm. the lines of the work that you and and Pilgen had done in the past. Um, I wonder if there's some sort of interpretation of that as well. But yeah, we haven't looked at that in detail. Okay, thank you. Um, And if as I see no questions in the audience for now, may I ask another yeah. question? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, so this thing you mentioned about more general things that can possibly happen in higher dimensions, uh, not just EA times EA, but and, and SO32 as in K3, but maybe more things in the in the log semi-stable generations of higher dimensional varieties. Could it possibly be that you just get um, uh, uh, smaller algebras than EA times EA and so 32 because uh it, it i mean it, it's again recoupling limit but um because you are in so so this week k3 case so semi sub degeneration lead to 10 dimensional full decomplexification to heterodic mm -hmm. in 10 d and you cannot turn on wilson lines at all there because you don't have any tori right. but maybe in higher dimensions you just go up uh to like if you start from 60 then you just get to 80 and then you can still uh, uh, turn on some bundles in heterotic size so you can mm -hmm. still get weakly couple heterotic but with some partial fixing done to the uh, EA times EA or SO32. So could it be that it's just I think just this kind fixing? of thing is possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely do. And there's there's even weirder things to uh, along the line of the CHL string and then dropping that down in dimension. So there's, yeah, there's some weird um, possibilities that are, are floating around. I had personally thought of these sort of different log semi stable degeneration limits as not necessarily interpretable in terms of, I mean, they didn't have to be just the weak coupled EA cross E8 or, you know, the weak coupled type 2B. Like I was imagining that there's just other, you know, strange sort of amorphous limits that one could take. What we seem to be seeing is that more of them look heterotic than I was expecting, at least. Um, so this like structure of, you know, you're getting semi stable degeneration limits, but over sections instead of base geometry. So uh, the, the questions you're asking are totally relevant. And I would imagine, yes, things like that can happen. Um, at the moment, we have a handful of examples, but we're very far from a complete characterization of those degenerations. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.